So I'm going to talk about how the fact that this planet is becoming more and more urbanized and that we are more and more people, how that could actually create a new food paradigm. Yeah. Because the reality is, as Hans Heron also mentioned, that more than 50% of the world's population <laughs> already lives in cities. And a lot of people believe that in 2050, it could be so close to 80% of the population that lives in cities. That is, by most people, perceived as being a huge problem. But why not uh, look upon it as an opportunity? But I'm just going to take you through a little bit of numbers and graphs because in the north, where most of us live, we have a tendency to believe that the rest of the world looks somewhat like our own world. And I'd like to challenge that a little bit. So these are our FAO figures of the growth in plant production over the last 40 years. And you'll see that, that the world has been divided into six regions. And they're a bit unusual, so I'm just going to tell you that the top one is Asia, the second one from the top is Latin America, the third one is the OECD, so that's Europe, the United States, Canada, Japan and Australia. And then you have Middle East and North Africa, then you have Sub-Saharan Africa, and then FSU is the former Soviet Union. So that's how the FAO do, do their ag agricultural statistics, for very good reasons. But as you'll see, we've had a steady growth in plant production per hectare, measured in calories per hectare per day, which is what the graph shows. But what it also shows is that the OECD, which often perceives itself, perceives itself as the master of the universe, actually comes in a miserable third. And that's in spite of the fact that we've been throwing obscene amounts of capital at uh, making agriculture more intensive and more efficient, supposedly. But we come in a miserable third, regardless of that. So, as Hans Heron also said, there's actually food enough. If you look at the bowls at the bottom, they represent the food bowl in measured in calories in these six different regions. And the only region to have a bowl which is too small is Africa. But that is more than um, compensated by the fact that the OECD has a bowl which is far too large for our own health. So just to let you know that there is food enough, that it's not the fact that we cannot grow enough food that is the challenge. But now, let's take a look at these figures in a more, in a different approach. And that is that uh, the black line that takes the OECD very far to the right shows how we have mechanized and, um, and motorized agriculture to an extreme. So the bottom, uh, the, the X line there is how many, how large an, an land area is cultivated per agricultural worker. So what the OECD has done is we've substituted labor massively with technology and machinery and fossil fuels. And below us, you can see the former Soviet Union who's been miserable at trying to mimic that. But we've, we've moved labor productivity very far to the right. Uh, whereas Asia and Latin America, who actually beat us at productivity, have actually stayed very much in smallholder agriculture. So it's not too late to reverse the trend towards industrialization. The world average is actually still in there, where the farms are typically one to two hectares. So that's a very important thing to bear in mind. So, lots of food is being grown on small plots. Lots of them are still in rural areas, but increasingly so, they also take place in urban areas. And you can actually grow 50 tons of healthy food per hectare using sustainable, ecological, intensive methods in the cities, 
whether it's horticulture or orchards or um, uh, other crops. So it's absolutely possible to have highly productive systems in the cities. This structure is from the Amazon, where there are large areas that, where the soil is too acidic to grow classical horticultural crops. So the Amazon Indians, Indians three, 4,000 years ago, created uh, what you could call anthropogenic soils. They created soils that, that allowed them to grow these crops where they would otherwise not grow because the soil was too acidic along the river. And it actually allowed them to become sedentary rather than being uh, hunters and gatherers. And uh, although I love Tor's romantic, you know, big rethink of the world into hunters and gatherers, I can tell you that, that that world out there is a fairly cruel world. And there are not many human rights in a hunters and gatherers world because Mother Nature would just treat us as one species compared to a lot of other species. So if you want to go down that way, you have to be prepared for a fairly brutal world compared to the world of, um, of more sedentary agriculture. I won't go into that in great depth, but uh, just to say that, that uh, you know, uh, Greenland was colonized by the Danes and uh, we had to leave again because it got too cold up there. And that, that sort of system would, would happen if we um, allowed ourselves to become hunters and gatherers to a large extent. So, um, back to uh, this story. Here you can see, again, structures that are um, a long tradition of Amazon India's creating uh, artificial soils to allow themselves to grow crops. Now, I find this interesting if we are supposed to begin growing food in urban structures. So this shows that you don't have to have one meter depth of soil onto every single roof to be able to grow crops in cities. You can actually do it, and this is a technology that's been out there for 3,500 years. So it's not something that's untried. It's actually tested and tried for a long time. And these two lettuces have actually been grown in a soil that mimics this Amazon Indian principle. Uh, in the Amazon, it's called the terra preta, and they also have a hybrid called the terra mulata, and this is a slightly paler terra daniesa that uh, we've created to experiment with these artificial soils. Now, we've now left the Amazon River, and what you see there is actually the East River and the Hudson River and Brooklyn because this is a map of the opportunity to grow food within um, New York City. This is a study made at Columbia University just a couple months ago. And uh, what it shows, if this thing, is that, that if you look at metropolitan New York City, it actually has significant land resources available, at least in principle. So there are 2,000 hectares of unused land. There are 20,000 hectares of parks. I'm not suggesting that they should be, you should be growing potatoes there, but you could actually grow a lot of fruit in those parks if you made the decision to do so. And there are 20,000 hectares of private yards. So that's surprising that, that as, as much private yard land as all of the parks in metropolitan New York. So it's quite significant. And then, in the end, as at the bottom, as you can see, there are 15,000 hectares of rooftop. If you put that land into uh, some sort of horticultural production, the, the theoretical potential is vast. So it's close to three million tons of plant food per year that you could grow inside metropolitan New York. Mankind, after becoming sedentary 10,000 years ago, has actually eaten into 10% of the total agricultural land for urban purposes and roads. And we are still losing about 40,000 square kilometers per year to urbanization. And most of that land is actually good agricultural land because almost every city in the world is, was based in an agricultural setting. So whenever we take land uh, away for urbanization, or it's almost invariably good agricultural soil. And we're taking away 
the equivalent of 50 New York cities per year. Who can we talk to about this? Who ever got into this kind of a mess as a species or as a civilization? And, and what can we do about it? Where can we find solutions? Apart from the, 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 the examples of creating soils and using them in cities that, I have, that I've already mentioned. Well, we could get in touch with antkind. Because if you take mankind on one side of the scales and antkind on the other side of the scales, who do you think is the heavier? Do we may weigh more than the ants or do they may weigh more than us? Well, you know, in Denmark, we are always very, you know, um, uh, understanding. And so it's actually the same. So I'm not giving you a difficult question. It's actually the same. So the ants of this world weigh the same as mankind. Now, I don't notice ants all over the place. I don't see them as being a huge nuisance and a polluter. They actually have found ways of organizing themselves in very intelligent ways. And it's not that they're that different from us. They're different from us, but many of their habits are the same. They live in cities primarily, they farm, and they keep livestock. In their case, it's mostly aphids that they milk, and when they stop milking them, they eat them. Does it sound familiar to you? There's an ant civilization out there, which is incredibly efficient. They have no fitness centers, but they can lift their own body weight times eight any time. So they have something that they've worked out, although they supposedly do not have the, the mental capacity that we do as individuals. But as a collective, they are very clever in how they go about things. And then they have another thing going for them. It's they've been around a lot longer than we have. You know, we are second generation immigrants into this planet compared to the track record that the ants have. So probably we should, uh, we should be listening to these uh, wonderful little creatures um, to, um, to find out solutions to our predicament. Now, this is uh, um, Lucius Favus. This is the yellow meadow ant. And it is uh, quite a regular ant um, in Denmark and across Europe. Um, and <clears throat> when I uh, spoke to René about the ant side of things, he then said, can't you get hold of some? Because then we can eat them. Because they taste great. <laughs> so, um, you know, you never leave a, a conversation with René without some sort of challenge that you have to go home and then check out or look into or figure out. Yeah. So, when I'm done, uh, and we'll have another couple of speakers, we actually invite you to the first uh, degustation of ants <coughs> in Denmark, at least. <laughs> and I, I rec highly recommend this, so if you're brave enough, come and have some ants. Now, due to time constraints, we couldn't do the full Monty because we were thinking of doing a an ant sushi, so we would put an emma corn and then put every single ant on an emma corn, so it would be like a, a tiny little sushi, but uh, time was, uh, was not on our side, so you're going to have them uh, uh, al fresco. Um, what I'd like you to think about is that there's no doubt that we can learn from our ancestors, but we can also learn from our ant sisters, because to solve the equation of being nine or 10 billion people on this planet and farming sustainably is a huge challenge. Um, but uh, sometimes, you know, scale is what blanks your mind out. Uh, I was surprised to hear that the ants um, uh, were actually as heavy as, um, as humankind. 
Uh, but I was also just a, sur a, surprise, a surprise to hear that the, the present population of just over six billion people can actually sit down, all of them, on the island of Zealand. They can't lie down, but they can sit down. <laughs> so although 6.5 billion people sounds like this incredibly big um, uh, number, we can actually invite them for drinks, sort of discotheque-wise, on the island of Zealand if we wanted to. But what then the problem is that although we can all fit into the island of Zealand, we make a point of being incredibly wasteful and polluting all over the planet. I think that's where we could learn from the ants, to concentrate our shit and then share it, as Tor would say. So I think that's one of the things we could learn from the ants. And then we need tons of clever ways of living in cities. And where industrial agriculture is monotonous, urban agriculture has the potential to be incredibly creative. That could be the, the handheld device where industrial agriculture is the mainframe that is complicated and difficult to program and so on and so forth. So I think that urban agriculture has the potential to unleash enormous creativity. And then urban agriculture has an interesting quality also. It is that there's nobody to fight for that resource with us because for industrial agriculture, that area has been lost. There's no way that they think they can farm in cities because that, that there's no way that you can farm on an in industrial scale to the city. So we won't be fighting for resources with, if we do that. And then probably more than anything else, this idea of urban agriculture latches onto the discussion about biodiversity uh, uh, 20 years ago, when we were asking the Brazilians to save 30% of the Amazon or 40% of the Amazon and to tell the Indonesians that they couldn't cut down the jungle. And they very rightly asked us in the north about, how about yourself guys, how yourselves guys, what have you been doing? We said, oh, we have not very little left that's interesting, with just a little batches around. We look to care, take care of them. And they would then ask us, does that mean that just because you cut down your trees a thousand years ago, you get off for free? So the, the people in the south would ask us, we need to take care of our resources before we tell them what to do. And I think that if we got a grip of urban agriculture in a substantial way, it would be a wonderful way of uh, inspiring the South to do the same, who suffer huge urbanization problems. So I think this is an area where the North could show the way, take these inspirations, and bring them into something really interesting. So urban agriculture can also serve a greater global social purpose. So, this is, uh, let's have some antipasti, um, um, and uh, you'll see here, here is René in his fifth incarnation, uh, when, he's, uh, when he's eating 30,000 ants a day. Um, but um, 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 but uh, if anybody has, uh, the, and maybe we should, René, sometimes, you know, examples are important. So I think you should have a go at the Okay, the I'll, do uh, I'll do that, I'll do that. Let's, uh, let's have an ant or two. Um, I will take, I, well, I, I've actually had several already, so, mm -hmm. well, I will do it. Yeah. So the trick is, we put them out here, and they're just, can we have the camera here? They're just everywhere. Oh, there's a lot of them, and they're all yellow, and I, I'll have <coughs> one crawling on me. What I failed to say, because the ants got the better of me, was that, that there is a fourth take-home message, and it is vitally important they would give our children the skills to deal with these issues and to actually be, have the, the, yeah. the skills to there create an urban agricultural um, civilization. Thank you. And come, 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 come.